Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest back, back again, uh, Peter Sternlich from the Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And we're going to be talking story today about Hawaii's hydrogen energy system and what it means for Hawaii. So welcome back to the show, Peter, and thank you very much for coming on as a guest. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Appreciate it. Yeah, so I bet uh, the people out there didn't know we had a Hawaii energy, uh, hydrogen energy system. So I want to just educate a little bit right at the start. Uh, this is not death by PowerPoint by any means. So if you can help pull up that first slide, Ash. So I just want to go through the, uh, the main uh, topic. So Really, I, I think it's helpful if everybody understands what the system kind of looks like. And uh, starting on the left, you know, we start our system off with our energy sources that we have here in Hawaii. So geothermal, wind, solar, biomass, some hydro. And then we use those sources to actually make hydrogen. So you see the, uh, the box hydrogen production, and we have various ways of making uh, hydrogen with electrolysis or using thermal processes. Then we want to store the hydrogen. So we have hydrogen storage technologies. We can compress it as a gas. We can uh, convert it into a liquid. And we can uh, store it inside a hydride, which is like a, a, a metallic sponge. Then we uh, want to distribute this hydrogen. So we have dispensers. We have tube trailers. We have pipelines. And then we have a variety of end uses, transportation, industrial, like uh, we use hydrogen for refining uh, crude oil, and for power, which is same thing as saying electricity, like the grid. And uh, so we can use it for energy storage and combine heat and power. So those are the basic uh, top level uh, elements of uh, what constitutes a hydrogen system. And so hopefully you'll all kind of have that kind of a mental picture. And we actually do have a hydrogen system here in Hawaii already on the big island. If you look at my hydrogen uh, fueling station at Nelha, we have all those components in there with the energy source being the grid. We have, a, we have an electrolyzer. We store hydrogen there. We distribute it and dispense it. And our end use happens to be hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. So uh, with that, uh, I'll go to our next slide. And we're going to start talking story about various elements in this hydrogen system. And I'm going to lead off uh, Peter, Peter, but let's, let's talk about the role uh, of hydrogen and the future of transportation. Sure. Um, so, hydro. What one of the things that's happening is that besides climate change and our need to um, to eliminate the use of fossil fuels, is that we're also um, running into a resource depletion situation with petroleum. What what essentially our attempt to uh, mitigate climate change has involved is putting renewable energy onto the grid. But we really haven't put much attention into looking at what's going to replace the fossil fuels, the liquid fossil fuels that we use for transportation. Hydrogen has a role to play in the large scale transportation, such as um, maritime shipping, large uh, trucks on the highway, um, it, it can serve as battery backup for grid storage because the fuel cell systems and the hydrogen are less expensive than um, the, uh, the lithium ion batteries that are currently being proposed. Um, th so the, th what, what hydrogen brings to the equation is portability. Um, so that's, that's basically how I see it. So, um... In, in the old days, when uh, we used coal to uh, power ships, uh, the ships couldn't carry enough coal necessarily all the time to go all the way across the uh, Pacific. So, so Hawaii was actually a coaling station. It's like, you know, supplying coal so the ships could come across and get re refueled and then carry on their trip. And, uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the way the hydrogen economy could develop, it, Hawaii could kind of become that again because. You know, as we talked about when we we're talking about the show, you know, the ships, uh, you know, the hydrogen is slightly uh, less dense than, than fossil fuels. 
And so you have to carry more hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives on board your ship and at the expense of giving up cargo carrying space. Yeah, so, it's yeah, it's actually it's a, it's significantly less. Uh, very reasonably, the energy density of of any of the proposed um, hydrogen uh, molecules that would be used for a maritime transport, methanol, um, some form of ammonia or other liquid organic hydrogen carrier, LOHC, is probably about half of what you find in in bunker fuel now. So yeah, it's I mean the the transport makes their money by by selling cubic feet storage area. And either they're going to refuel halfway or they're going to have to double their their fuel capacity. So it that's an economic decision they're going to make. But I agree with you. I I my sense is is that they're going to opt for refueling. So one of the uh one of the uh interesting ones is if we look at light duty vehicles, passenger cars, they're not necessarily uh have to be hydrogen. Let's can you comment on that, Peter? Sure. I I mean for instance, I have a plug-in EV right now, and it's easy to for me to charge it at home overnight. I have solar panels. It's it's you know living on an island. I've never experienced um, any limitation due to distance. I think in large metropolitan areas, we're going to see over time that consumers are going to like the advantage of hydrogen because it doesn't take very long to refuel your vehicle. You can refuel um, a hydrogen vehicle in basically the same amount of time it takes you to refuel with with petroleum or with gasoline now. So I think people are going to start valuing that time. Also, the infrastructure for refuel for for charging is going to become cumbersome. I mean, there are a lot of people who aren't right. going to have access to that, and the number of charging stations that you're going to need to be able to accommodate a large public fleet of electric vehicles is going to be pretty extensive. Yeah, yeah. on Oahu, certainly a battery electric vehicle, you can uh, light duty vehicle could make sense because you don't have the long ranges. Uh, and some of the other neighbor islands like Maui and, and uh, uh, Kauai, but you know, on the big island, it, the big island is big, you know? And so you, you uh, some people, probably will find that they would like to have the uh, the extra range. I know it also, they have very long grades. If you go over the saddle road, apparently there's mile marker or whatever, 21 or whatever Riley Sato tells me. But there's a guy who hangs out there with his tow truck because he says that's that's where the battery electric vehicles run out of steam because they're going up this what whatever percent grade uh, continuously and it just drains the battery out of it. And by the time they get to that mile marker, they're empty. So they need yeah. a tow as it gets most of his business from that. So moving on, I'm, and I'm not, I notice I'm not bad mouthing uh, battery electric vehicles, but just, I, I did notice some, that. Just, and thank you. Did you notice that? I noticed that. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the next slide. We want to talk a little bit about the difference between the electrical uh, energy and uh, transportation energy. So, Peter, why don't you jump in there and talk about the difference between power and uh, transportation fuels? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we again, we've, we've really primarily focused on electricity, and electricity is, is primarily used to power our static infrastructure, buildings, uh, public lighting, that kind of thing. And um, the other, one of the other kinds of energy um, is transportation fuel, which has to be portable. Um, solar panels you know, other than, for instance, how I use mine to charge my EV is not portable. So essentially, we're trying to electrify our way of life around the world, um, which is what you have to do when you eliminate the use of fossil fuels. Yeah. So, so there has to be a way to store electricity. Hydrogen actually is an energy carrier. It carries electricity. It is not really a fuel source with with the exception of if you burn it. So hydrogen can be used for high heat industrial processes, but as it pertains to transportation, you need you need portability. So, and that's certainly gonna be the case with long distance um, transportation, which is trucking, 
which is maritime use, which is aviation, um, that's, you know, rail, that kind of thing. So um, we, it, it's really important to look at them as separate issues. Also, the ease of, of, electri- of, of putting renewable fuel on the grid, renewable energy on the grid, right. is the fact that that, in, that connective infrastructure exists. It's going to accept the power that comes from solar panels and, and wind turbines, et cetera, et cetera. With, I mean, there's logistical and, and technical issues that, that, that the grid operator has to deal with. But essentially, we're not replacing the entire con- connective infrastructure. Changing liquid fuels, virtually the entire system has to change. You have to change right. the machinery that consumes it. You have to change the infrastructure that transports it. And you have to change the infrastructure that produces the product. Yeah, it's a huge deal, uh, changing all the infrastructure. So I have a slide deck that I use. It's called like the infrastructure stupid. I mean, that's what that's the big challenge for hydrogen is developing all this infrastructure. Um, and we, we don't have any essentially here in Hawaii right now, except I have my hydrogen station at Nelha and uh Toyota dealership has a hydrogen station there, and there are a couple of stations on the military bases. But virtually, there's no, uh, there are no hydrogen fueling stations, and it's kind of a chicken and the egg. You know, it's like, you know, uh, I'd love to buy a car myself, a hydrogen car, having built the world's first one way back in the day. Um, but I, my first question is, well, where am I going to get the hydrogen for it? And uh, the question, and the answer is. There, there is no obvious place to get it. So it's going to take us a while to build that out, like four or five years at least, and it's going to take a heck of a lot of money to do it. And, but eventually it's going to come, but it's it's like uh, Richard Haas says, you know, a farmer's farm when uh, farmers make money. It's the same as the uh, private industry will, will start investing more in the hydrogen infrastructure when they see they can make money. So until they do, the uh, the government's going to have to carry the load. They're going to have to prime prime the pump uh, to make uh, make this work, like they're doing in California. You know, the California state of California is pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into developing a a whole uh, hydrogen infrastructure throughout the state, so that you know when people buy their hydrogen car or lease it, uh, they've got a place to fill it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, the 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 problem, the way that I see it, is that. If we leave it to the market, it's it it is not going to occur quickly enough to be able to to deal with resource depletion um, or climate change for that matter. I mean, the scale is just too large. Um, private industry just doesn't work that way. I mean, if it's not if it's not a guaranteed return today or in the next ninety days, they shy away from it. They don't like to change. They're going to run on legacy infrastructure and, and product lines. And that's going to be that. In order to deal with climate change and with the, the scale of, of what's needed to replace liquid fossil fuels for global for the, for the global um, economy transportation system, it's going to require massive input from government. It has to be a public-private partnership like we've never seen before. As we've seen uh, seen recently with the Biden administration, they've come out with this, I've never seen so much money coming hydrogen's way, like seven billion with a B dollars. Like back in the day, you know, uh, President Bush came out with 1.2 billion and uh, that really goosed the hydrogen industry. Uh, The problem is it wasn't sustained, but with seven or eight billion dollars on the line plus all the other stuff they're doing you know hydrogen's day may have come uh, because that's the kind of money we're talking about so even the state of hawaii you know we we were very fortunate to uh be uh, one of the uh, down selected to put in a final proposal for one of these what they call hydrogen hub projects yeah and uh you know that's uh big dollars we're talking billions of dollars uh to put all this stuff together now of course yeah in Hawaii, we spent billions of dollars doing our rail, so fourteen billion. I guess we're up to now. So we're used to using these big numbers now. Maybe. What do you think about that? I think that's not enough. I think that globally, we're going to need multiple, multiple trillions of dollars um, right now. And we are. We actually, Sustainable Energy Hawaii is part of the consortium of companies right. that's participating with the Hawaii State Energy Office 
in its submission to be included as one of the regional hydrogen hubs. Hawaii has a, has a, a strategic advantage for transportation that, that I don't think you will find anywhere on the mainland. But the billions that are being allocated for, the, for hydrogen now, and specifically the way that it was, it was designed by the Department of Energy, really primarily targets the existing hydrogen production market, which is used for refining petroleum and in the chemical industry, to, to get them to stop using natural gas and steam methane reforming and um, a, a large contributor of, of uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. So, I mean, one of the reasons I come to that conclusion is because there was no funding for renewable energy um, generation within within the bill, within the uh, the infrastructure bill. So, without without a, a significant additive uh, um, amount of electricity, it's not reasonable to see green hydrogen being a significant um, contributor anywhere within within. Um, the design of this uh, of this legislation. Yeah, well, they were asking for a minimum of 50 tons per day of hydrogen to be produced. And if you look at the amount of electricity that requires every day, I mean, that's a huge number. And really, uh, let's take, go on to one of our favorite topics. Let's, I mean, really, if you think about it, geothermal is probably the only way we're actually going to get there to make this transition over to fossil fuels because of the amount of energy is required, for example, to make hydrogen. Um, I agree. Um, what's interesting is the DOA is looking for 50 to 100, and this is a minimum, 50 minimum. to 100 metric tons a day, which might offhand sound like a lot. Um, the state of Hawaii uses 44 million barrels of oil a year. If you take that volume of oil and multiply it by two and a quarter, and then multiply that by 365, you get the amount of oil that's consumed globally each day. We consume 44 million a year. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, the world con consumes 100 million a day. Yeah. So, um, Bar I think barrel. I threw in that 365 was was not quite right, but it, it, it's it, if you multiply it by two and a quarter, that's the daily consumption globally. So, and that's our annual consumption. So, um, I took that figure and I did a little math, you know, converting petroleum into hydrogen because they have measurable um, energy content. Right. And to replace the oil that we currently consume on an annual basis we would need 7,000 metric tons of hydrogen a day. So these efforts are, are noble, but they are not going to get us to where we need to, do, need to go quickly enough. We need to really shift into high gear. So let's talk about the financial uh, part of this. What, what kind of a financial commitment is needed for this, uh, Peter? In your opinion. Well, it, it, it's in the billions. I mean, for instance, if we were to take where we know there's um, there's geothermal energy, which is the which is the Big Island, um, we would need dedicated just for for that seven thousand metric tons a day. We would need uh, in the neighborhood of a gigawatt that is right. just for hydrogen dedicated not used for anything else I, I i hesitate to to throw a number out but i don't think that i i, I think we're somewhere around 90 megawatts a day for the island for our, just our normal power consumption uh, so no, we're about a, we're about 180 uh, okay, megawatts okay so thank yeah. you um so it's um it's so what it's uh five, six times what the island currently uses just to yeah. produce that hydrogen. And then if we, what we want to do is, is function as a, as a refueling depot, that volume is going to have to be in, increased by fact, multiple, by, 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 by orders of magnitude. So I think the, the thing that is really 
critical is for people to get wrap their heads around the magnitude of this problem. Um, I saw I saw an interview with with Nate Hagens and Art Berman, and Art has been in the oil industry for forty years. And he yeah. said, as long as I've been in this business, I myself did not understand the magnitude of what we're facing. Yeah, it's a huge uh, issue. And uh, in some ways, it sounds depressing. Um, because, you know, how can we do all this? You know, I mean, you know, if we if we don't want to use geothermal for a variety of reasons, you know, what's the alternative? Import hydrogen from mainland or from Australia or other people? Just going to be like importing oil. We're going to have to pay that much more, uh, you know, for the transportation costs of uh, bringing it into Hawaii. So, um, well, the price of everything is going to go up. So, yeah. I mean, th there is nothing that we consume that doesn't have the price of energy baked into it. So, the cost of our food, the cost of, you know, all the dry goods, all the canned goods, everything else. I mean, ninety percent of what we eat in this state is brought in on boats. Um, everything requires energy to be manufactured. Every, you know, even the solar panels and wood turbines require petroleum powered mining equipment just to get us the natural resources to make that stuff and then to transport it to wherever we're going to use it. So it, it, the, the issue is, is a much more complex than just, Hey, let's put up some solar panels and we'll be fine. It's just, yeah, do you it's, wanna... it's not an accurate view. Do we want to cover all our islands totally with solar panels? Like, for example, it takes five acres of solar panels to produce one megawatt of electricity, and it only does that for like five hours of the day, and then and then you have no sun for the you know the, uh, three quarters of the day. So that's well, that, not going to work. If, and that's if you, it's not cloudy or raining. Yeah, exactly. And so, what about wind? Are we going to have these monster wind turbines? I hear some of them are like five hundred feet high now. You know, are we going to cover our islands with that? Are we going to put them on floating platforms uh, out in the ocean? Uh, how, yes. are we, how are we going to do that? These these are very good questions. But right now, until we until we realize that liquid transportation fuels are really an issue that are that is going to impact everything that moves, which is everything we consume, um, you know, the illusion of solar and wind being the mitigating factor for climate change and or um, our energy transition, it, 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 I, no, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So I wanna bring up another subject though. Like I, I've told you this story, when I first came to Hawaii, Henry Curtis, who I love this guy, you know, he, you know, he got right to the point. He said, Mitch, he says, uh, we're at you know, this conference. He says, what's it going to take for us to convert over to hydrogen? You know, he was pinging me. And I said, Henry, you know, it's going to take $10 a gallon gasoline because people aren't going to do anything until they start hurting. Right. And if you, if you look at it right now, we're not hurting. Nobody's worried. I mean, I can still go to the gas station, fill my car up with gas. I turn on the light. You know, it goes on. And so it's like the what they say when you're boiling is that boiling a frog, you put them in this uh, um, the warm water and then you slowly turn up the heat until he finally realizes he's being cooked. And that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're, we're, we don't have that sense of urgency, like you said, like a, a wartime mentality, you know, where they're turning out B-25s like every half hour. To, when they mobilized industry to get after this. And this is sort of the kinds of things we're going to have to start looking at because that that temperature, I'm, I'm not saying cli just climate change, it's just like, you know, your resources are being depleted more. I mean, the consumption of, of fossil fuels is going up. It's not going down. We're adding more people to the planet. What, another billion here, another billion there? And they all want yeah. the same things we do. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to take. I don't know where that level of pain is where we finally say, geez, I got to do something about this. Well, yeah, I mean, that's yes, that's that. When that pain comes, um, my sense is, is that the people who are feeling it and don't understand where it's coming from are going to want to be blaming someone and they're yeah. <laughs> not going to be very happy. And, you know, so. 
what we're really looking at is a need for a cultural change. Oh, earthquake. Um, yes, my, my house is shaking. Um, so we're really looking at the need for a cultural change where, 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 where we're not, or we don't have this God given entitlement to have everything we want the moment we want it. Right. And the scale of what we consume yeah. is going to have to contract. If you look at a chart that maps energy consumption on a global basis against global GDP, you will find that the two things track within 1% of each other. Um, and yeah. the reality is, is that as we transition, there will be less energy, which means the economy and the GDP is going to contract. And the entire system that we have, that we base our way of life on, is continuous expansion on a finite planet. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. So so we don't end on a Debbie Downer note, like, you know, it's all not doom and gloom. You know, the human race adapts. You know, when people are presented we with a problem, they, they start thinking about solutions. Uh, they invent new things. They solve the problems. And we get better at doing things. So there's all sorts of people out there that are inventing things as we speak. For example, I saw this uh, new technology, a new drilling technology that uses uh, like a microwave to blast through. Quays. Yeah, quays. Yeah. Uh, through uh, solid uh, granite. And they can dig it pretty fast and they can go yeah. down to 20, uh, uh, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, where the temperature is 500 degrees and they can drill anywhere. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be looking for water. You're just looking for that heat. So that's, right. uh, you know, new energy sources. And basically, just uh, getting smarter and uh, 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 conserving, like a, what they say, a, a, a kilowatt hour not used is a kilowatt saved. So, yeah, it's so Peter. It, uh, it's going to oh, go take. Ahead. It's going to take thinking differently, and I, I completely agree with you. So, Peter, uh, any final words before we wrap it up? Um, no, I, I mean, I, it, it just. Energy is something we need to understand. We need to understand the role it plays for us in our lives and where it comes from, and that it's not like the air we breathe. It's not just there on demand. Um, right. You know, I I don't want this to be a downer thing, but this is this is as important a a reality as there is in our lives. And 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 what you're doing to try to get the information out there, I think, is very important. Well, thanks, Peter. So we're going to leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean, ener uh, clean energy on ThinkTech Hawaii with Peter Sternlich, my hero, Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And today we've been talking story about Hawaii's hydrogen energy system. Remember that chart I put up right at the start? That's a key element so you all understand how it all fits together, how the big puzzle works. And thanks to our viewers uh, for tuning in. And I'm Mitch Yuan. I'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.